right. Um, let's begin the lecture on Hannah Arendt. This will be the uh, last lecture under the uh, modern period. <clears throat> In terms of a historical context, uh, Hannah Arendt and her family uh, moved to the United States. Um, they were German Jewish family that were escaping from the German Nazis during World War II. Uh, they came over to the US to get away from what would later turn out to be the uh, Holocaust. Um, when she was studying, she studied under the famous Martin Heidegger, who she had close relationships with. Um, uh, to be honest, I, I'm not sure whether they were romantic or not, but they definitely uh, worked very closely together as mentor and protege. Um, ironically enough, uh, her mentor, um, Martin Heidegger, turned out to be, a, at least momentarily, a supporter of the German Nazis. So it was a bit ironic that he would be on the Nazi side and then she would be on the Jewish side. Um, he later recanted, but it's unclear whether he supported under pressure from the Nazis or if he recanted under pressure from the Allies. Um, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, as far as Hannah Arendt goes, um, she also studied under um, another famous thinker called Walter Benj Benjamin or Walter Benjamin. Um, he, w he was also German Jewish. Uh, unfortunately, he did not survive World War II. Um, she kind of spread out on her own afterwards. Uh, during the Cold War, she became a prominent intellectual in her own right, which is why we're covering her today. Um, and so uh, let's go ahead and jump into her first text, which is called The Human Condition. It's an ambitious book trying to record the, um, the, the condition of humanity in the later half of the 20th century, which means underneath the Cold War, underneath the threat of the um, nuclear arms race, um, and underneath the um, kind of economic system of what would later become late stage capitalism. Um, and so let's go ahead and jump into the theories of the human condition. Um, she's, when she's talking about human existence, human existence kind of has three aspects that each live within their own setting. Right, so there's three aspects of human existence within three settings that are kind of overlapping with each other, but um, they kind of each represent our relationship to the world around us in a different way. Um, and so the first one that we'll cover is what she calls the human as the animal laborants uh, who lives on the planet Earth, right? Um, as you can see there on the first bullet for Arendt, uh, when she talks about the earth or the planet, uh, she's referring literally to the natural environment of the planet that gave birth to the human animal. Um, and the human animal laborans uh, literally means the laboring animal. This represents the human being as uh, just an animal that lives under a cyclical life of, you know, birth and growth and learning and work and eating and sleeping and then repeating that whole cycle again until eventually dying and decomposing under the ground, right? So uh, this is kind of like the cyclical aspect of human existence um, in, the, in, the, in the way that we're just like every other animal that also lives in a cycle, right? We live in a cycle of four seasons. Uh, we, we live in a cycle of, you know, um, growing on our own until reproducing, and then our children kind of go through what we went through, and then someday their children go through what we went through. And so uh, there's a beautiful passage where she describes, um, you know, this aspect of our existence as kind of like the 
uh, the passing of the leaves in fall, right? And then kind of their withering away in winter and then blooming again in the spring and then having a lifespan in the, in the summer. Um, and so, um, you know, this is us tightly, tightly tied to like the natural cycles of the earth itself, right? Um, and so the natural earth and the natural order of the earth and the animal aberrants and its cycles have not really um, changed throughout like the millennia, right? Like we just, we go through these types of cycles like every other human has since the first humans arose. Um, and so this is kind of like the animal aberrants on the planet Earth. Then the second aspect she talks about is what she calls homo faber, who lives in the world, right? Uh, homo faber is literally means man, the maker. And this, you know, human maker is, uh, you know, has made an artificially constructed world around himself, right? With all the things that, that kind of build up this artificially constructed world. So what, what she means by the world, as opposed to the natural planet, is, you know, the skyscrapers of cities, the sidewalks, the streets, the stores, roads, highways, bridges, subways, cars, planes, billboards, movies, video games, but she also includes the ideas and the narratives that kind of populate these, you know, artificially constructed worlds, right? There's an artificial world in here that helps create the artificial world out here, and that's part of this world, right? This, think of it as man the maker comes up with the blueprint before constructing it in reality. Um, and so all of those structures that, you know, narrative structures, ideological structures, and physical architectural engineering structures, um, you know, that these are the things that people create to populate the artificial world that we inhabit. And she points out that this creates a recursive process, right? Recursive means like it comes back on itself. So, you know, Homo Faber makes the world and then the world affects Homo Faber and shapes Homo Faber and then affects how Homo Faber continues to make the new world, right? So there's, you know, we affect the world, the world affects us, right? Then we affect the world and then the world affects us and it kind of just creates this loop of, but it's a loop kind of like in a spiral because it's moving in a straight line, right? So notice the world and Homo Faber exist in a linear history that changes with time. Um, and so, it, it, I mean, think about it. Like, our cities now don't look like cities in the 1920s, which don't look like cities in the 1820s, which don't look like cities in the 1720s, and so forth. Um, so there, there's definitely this idea of progress that is tied, you know, historically to the world and Homo Faber very different from the natural cycles of animal laborants and the planet Earth. This brings us to the third aspect of human existence, uh, which she calls Zuon Politikon, and the setting is the polis, right? So here, human beings, you know, as Zuon Politikon are the political animal. Uh, these are unique individuals, um, you know, uh, who inhabit the polis, which is a political arena. Think of Socrates and the Agora, right? Engaging in speeches and debates and dialectic uh, and getting a recognition, uh, making himself kind of famous or infamous, depending on your perspective, right? And so... Um, you know, the, the, this political animal, right, the Zuan Politikon, is in this polis, right, the city-state, which is a political arena. Um, it always takes place in a particular moment in space and time, right? There's no way you can repeat the, the 
moment that you engage in this political arena. There's never going to be another agora in a Greek city-state or any other kind of city-state like the one in Athens at the time that like Socrates was participating in politics there. Um, even, uh, you know, e even within the history of Athens and its own political arena, the moment that Socrates inhabits could not have happened before or after, right? It had to happen when it happened because, you know, when he winds up on trial, a lot of that has to do with like the fears of the Athenian democracy after what they just went through with the 30 tyrants, which was a result of losing the war against the Spartans in the Peloponnesian War. So, you know, the, the, the point Arendt makes is that like political, like these, these political arenas within which certain actors participate in, here actors not as in like somebody who's doing a fake role, here she means actors as in one who does, one who speaks, right, a doer, um, a person who engages in political action. Um, and so uh, these, these political actors, right, these doers, this political animal um, reveals themselves through the things they do and say within this political arena, right? And through the course of their lives, they kind of reveal themselves. Um, and this kind of, this story that they kind of reveal through their narrative, right? Their biography has to end obviously with the way they face their death. Right? Without the record of how a person faces their death, um, we don't really get to see them live up to the words and speeches they gave beforehand, right? Um, it is only when we see Socrates accept the guilty verdict and accept his execution and refuse to escape with Crito that we get to see that he really meant everything he was preaching about justice um, and about social debt um, and about virtue being more important than life, etc. And so it's, you know, once the person has revealed their life story and it concludes with the way they face their death, they leave behind these biographical narratives that become material for poets to shape into like these immortal images that echo across time. Um, you know, if, so you know, when Socrates faces his death, he leaves behind an impression on Plato, who's a great poet, who, you know, even though he hated the poets, um, which then winds up, you know, leaving a record for us in the dialogues that we read and then we get influenced by, that we get inspired by, that we begin to model after. Um, and so uh, the, the point here that, that Arendt is making is that it's only through these types of political actors or political animals engaging in these kinds of actions and lifespans within the political arena that we have these immortal figures that influence us and inspire us into the future to try to do similarly great things. Now, how do these three kind of aspects of human existence and these three settings, how do they relate to each other within the modern period that Arendt is writing in, in the 1950s and 60s, right? Well, she points out that uh, modernity, um, you know, uh, has removed political arena. Um, what she means by that is there's no longer a public space. There's no such thing as an agora where we can engage in debate. Um, you know, there, there's um, no such thing as a Senate that we all directly participate in where we can engage in like speeches that are meant to inspire greatness in other people. Um, the way we fight war uh, is such that um, there's no possibility for heroism or political agency, right? And, and what she means by that is, you know, not that uh, soldiers are not brave. That's not what she means. What she means is there's not really the possibility of a war hero like there was in the old days. Uh, you have to, like Socrates was a war hero. Uh, he single-handedly 
held back a squad of um, of Spartans during the Peloponnesian War to buy time for some of his comrades, the Athenians, to escape. Um, in in modern warfare, you've got a satellite bringing down a laser guided missile to blow up a building that has, you know, targets within it, and civilians are accepted uh, in terms of their death as collateral damage, right? Um, no matter how brave a soldier is, um, <clears throat> they are blown to bits with a squad around them by the shell from a tank. Um, and so kind of like what she's kind of getting at is that like even when it comes to warfare, right, um, human bodies against technological machinery of death and destruction kind of erases the possibility for heroism that we used to find in traditional societies and traditional warfare. And there's no longer these political open spaces where we can engage each other in public debate or discourse or in even, even in personal battles, right? So basically what she's pointing at is that the modern era has erased the Zuon Politikon and erased the polis and its political arena from existence. Um, even if, if a person tries to inspire other people, journalism is there to bring out all the terrible details of the personal lives, right? Um, as I mentioned, war machines massacre entire cities, right? Um, and hospital intensive care units hide away what used to be public deaths once upon a time. Um, you used to die on your deathbed with the entire community coming by to say goodbye and visit with you as you face the final moments. Now you're locked away behind the curtain in a locked room on a intensive care floor within a hospital behind, you know, gates uh, and the parking lot in one corner of the city, right? Um, and so the point she's making is like, even in our death, we can't face it bravely in front of witnesses who can then go on to tell our tale. Um, and so in, mod in the modern period, there is no polis and there is no Zuon Politikon anymore. I mean, look at your politicians. Would you call them heroic? I doubt it, right? Um, so what about the next thing, right? Well, she points out in the next bullet that um, automation, the assembly line, AI, social media, uh, reality TV, right? That these things have kind of taken over the creative process. And as a result, there's very little or no room for homo faber, right? Uh, man, the creator, has been replaced by AI, right? Uh, once upon a time, we started creating robotic, uh, automated robots and, and artificial intelligence we, with the idea that uh, we were going to get them to do the labor to free the human beings for the creative stuff, right? But now, thanks to corporate leaders and engineers, um, they've decided to make AI creative and let us continue working for almost no money, right? Um, not exactly the picture that we all had of the utopia we were hoping for in the future when we had robots and AI working for us. Now, in a way, we're working for them. Um, you've got, you know, AI created artwork, you know, AI created scripts, AI created um, uh, special effects and graphics and movies and video games. So um, the, the point that Arendt, I mean, this is all before, uh, after Arendt's time period, but the point is she was already kind of seeing the direction it was heading in. Um, she basically is pointing out that man the maker, right, the, the human creative uh, thinker is kind of uh, being reduced and replaced by technology. And uh, the result is that we have various places around the world are becoming kind of this generic uniform backdrop composed of clone shopping centers and cookie cutter subdivisions. You don't have a Frank Lloyd Wright making these beautiful unique houses. Um, you know, instead you've got you know, these generic houses that there's at least 15 copies of within a subdivision 
within 25 subdivisions within each of the cities that looks almost exactly the same as all the other cities. Um, your shopping centers, you got your Starbucks, your Target, uh, you know, your, your Ross, uh, you know, your, you know, five below and that's it. And then maybe your H E B, right? Um, and so one of the things she's pointing out is like, um, you know, artificiality has kind of taken over the creative process. And as a result, we all live in this kind of like generic place that has been multiplied across the country for sure. And someday across the world uh, as well, right? So homophobber, uh, there's no room for homophobber anymore. So obviously this leaves only the animal laborants, right? Um, we have all been turned by, uh, by the rich and by the system of capitalism and by the technology available. Uh, we've all been turned into uh, these kind of uh, animals that work to buy, produce to consume, right? So we, we work to buy, to work to buy, to work to buy until we die. And then someone buys a coffin for us and continues working to buying for themselves until it's their turn. Right? We produce to consume, to produce, to consume, to produce, to consume. We are living in a new cycle, but it's kind of like a laboring, uh, like, a, like a an the animal laborants is no longer grazing in the fields, right? We're kind of trapped in these little cubicles like the cows that we milk in these factories now. Um, and that's us too, right? We live in a cubicle, we travel in a cubicle, and we work in a cubicle. Um, and so ironically, the Earth planet home of animal aberrants is also disappearing as a result of this producing, consuming of the animal aberrants, right? We're, we're working to eat, to work to eat, to work to eat to such an extent. And by eat here, I mean consume to such an extent that we're consuming the planet itself and climate destruction and the Anthropocene, right? Which is the new geological period where humanity is responsible for the majority of the changes on, on the planet, um, you know, has reached uh, a fever pitch, right? There's 8 billion animal laborances at this point on, on Earth consuming itself out of a sustainable home. So, you know, the only thing that's left is the animal laborants working to consume, to work to consume, and very quickly it's consuming itself out of a planet. So therefore, very soon there won't be an animal laborants left either. Um, and so this kind of concludes some of the warnings that Hannah Arendt poses within the, hu the human condition. Um, next, I'm going to finish up with Hannah Arendt with two books that she kind of wrote uh, around the same time. Uh, you have to remember, you know, she, she lived through um, World War II and what the Nazis were doing, but she also lived under... She also got to see what Stalin was up to uh, with the communists in the Soviet Union and how many people were killed there. Um, and she kind of saw what the Americans were up to with their own form of kind of uh, capitalist uh, imperialism by the establishment of military bases around the world. And so uh, she writes a book called The Origins of Totalitarianism, right? Totalitarianism is uh, a... Uh, an autocratic form of uh, of government that gives total control to the government and gives strips away human rights from the individual, right? So the origins of totalitarianism is one book. She also wrote another book called Eichmann in Jerusalem. Eichmann was uh, a Nazi officer who was responsible for approving the execution of Jewish people during the Holocaust. He escapes World War II, he moves to South America, creates a new identity for himself until the secret agency called the Mossad from, is from, uh, from Israel tracks him down like 15, 20 years later. Um, they track him down to South America. Um, they find a way to kidnap him and they bring him back to Israel to stand trial. Right? And Hannah Arendt went to the trial, watched the trial, 
and then wrote a book based off what she observed. Um, and so I'm fusing the ideas from both of these two books because in a, in a way she's kind of wrestling with a lot of the same things in both of them. How does a culture that values science and technology and art and literature like the Germans uh, end up becoming this genocidal killing machine that cranks out corpses, right? Uh, in, in a bid to try to take over the world. How does that happen? And can it happen again, right? And her, the short answer is yes, it can and will happen again. And so it's important for us to understand, you know, how how people get there, right? What, you know, what 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 does she notice, or how does she see this happening? So in the first quote, she tells us, in an ever-changing, incomprehensible world, the masses reach the point where they would, at the same time, believe everything and nothing, thinking that everything was possible and nothing was true. Now, this sounds familiar. Yes, it is. It should sound familiar. This is nihilism, right? Nihilism tells us nothing is true, everything is permitted. And so what Arendt is telling us is that the majority of the people have reached a certain type of nihilism by the 20th century. She is agreeing with Friedrich Nietzsche, who was wor worrying us and warning us about this uh, in the late 1800s, if you remember. So she continues with the quote and tells us, mass propaganda discovered that its audience was ready at all times to believe the worst, no matter how absurd, and did not particularly object to being deceived because it believed or it held that every statement was a lie anyway. Um, and so notice, one of the, I guess the starting point for totalitarianism, the starting point for a society that turns, you know, into a killing machine, is this belief that nothing is true, everything is allowed in politics, because it's all about power, right? Um, and so this is important for us to recognize. We in America in 2023 are plagued by, uh, I'd say maybe about half the population believing that it's okay to believe in lies as long as they're lies that align with your own political agenda. Um, and anybody else that says anything, they just call it, you know, fake news, right? And before you think that this is just about Trump followers, um, the, the idea is everybody calls everybody else fake news at this point. Um, and so this is kind of the starting point that, that Arendt is kind of getting at here, right? Nobody wants to believe anybody else at this point. And this kind of creates this attitude that I'm going to believe whatever I want to believe. And at the same time, I'm going to be free to do whatever I need to do or whatever I want to do to anybody who disagrees with me in the process, right? So this mindset is already kind of leading people in a certain direction. She says in the next bullet, and these are all direct quotes, by the way, um, before mass leaders seize the power to fit reality to their lies, their propaganda is marked by its extreme contempt for facts as such. For in their opinion, fact depends entirely on the power of man, of the man who can fabricate it. Right? So, the, the point here, the propaganda here that's being referred to by Arendt is, you know, TV, TV channels, newspapers, social media, news channels, right? These are propaganda machines. Um, they, they're no longer journalistic institutions called the Fifth Estate, who is trying to bring up the truth as a way of talking truth to power. That's no longer the case. These, these institutions are corporate entities designed to make profit and bring more power to the, the their their promoters right um, and so uh, this creates not only in the propaganda machines but in the viewers of the and the consumers of the propaganda machines it creates this contempt for facts right what is a fact what is truth right think of Pontius Pilate the Roman governor, um, when he's interrogating Jesus before the crucifixion, right? 
He says, you know, uh, what is truth is the question he asks Jesus, which Jesus responds to with silence, right? The same reason is a rent here, right? Because the idea is a recognition that people like this, who care only for power, in the end don't recognize the power of truth and don't even want to recognize truth as, as a thing even, right? She continues in the quote, the ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or the convinced communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction, i.e. the reality of experience, and the distinction between true and false, i.e. the standards of thought, no longer exist, right? Um, we, we, you know, thanks to the news, thanks to television and radio and the internet and websites and reality TV and social media, um, we've got people who can choose to believe the earth is flat, choose to believe that the moon landing was a hoax, choose to believe that, um, uh, you know, that, that there's this race of aliens called the lizard people that are posing as humans and they're our leaders. Um, free to believe in the spaghetti monster. That's a real thing, you can Google it. Um, and so, you know, when we create these echo chambers, right? These places where we can exist and only hear what we wanna hear and only hear what we agree with already. Um, the, the, this erases the possibility for conversation it erases the possibility for compromise. How can you compromise with someone who no longer connects to reality? And the question you should be asking is, are you connected to reality, right? Um, next bullet, next quote. Uh, Never has our future been more unpredictable. Never have we depended so much on political forces that cannot be trusted to follow the rules of common sense and self-interest, forces that look like sheer insanity, if judged by the standards of other centuries. It is as though mankind has divided itself between those who believe in human omnipotence, who think that everything is possible if one knows how to organize the masses for it, and those for whom powerlessness has become the major experience of their lives. The point is that both Hitler and Stalin held up promises of stability in order to hide their intention of creating a state of permanent instability, right? And here we can easily add America to that list of Stalin and Hitler. The, the point she's making is that um, people keep promising us stability, but they only make money and power from instability. So every decision they make is an insane decision, right? So not just talking about the insanity of trying to, you know, build more nuclear weapons for the that that when we already have enough to blow up the earth a thousand times over, right? That that is insane. Don't get me wrong, but that's not all she means, right? Um, you know, the Taliban supported Osama bin Laden to train to get ready for 9/11, knowing full well it would bring the American military over to Afghanistan and and give them violence on a mass scale, right? And yet, they do. They did it anyway, right? We, and then it played itself out, and 20 years later, we pull out, and the Taliban's in control of Afghanistan again, right? Um, notice, as insane as it is to ask for someone to bomb you at the same time, it has led to them continuing to control the situation because instability on a permanent basis allows certain people to remain in control, right? And I mentioned us because, in case you haven't noticed, despite whatever your political leanings are, we are always in a state of instability in this country, every, especially ever since the 21st century, um, you know, began. Um, because instability is profitable, right? And this isn't about Democrats or Republicans, it's about both, right? Both benefit, profit, and gain power from instability, right? That's what a rent would point out if she were still alive. Um, 
and and both sides tend keep tending to make decisions that are counterproductive right they in in other societies they would in other historical periods they would look like insane decisions for people who are supposed to be leading and taking care of the population um, continuing with the next quote um, what proved so attractive was that terrorism here she's using terror in the same way as as Camus right she did read Camus quite a bit um, terror is not just like random acts of terror as in like the you know Al-Qaeda or ISIS um, here terror also includes state terror right the terror created by state organizations not only through warfare on other countries but also through totalitarianism on their own population right and so back to this she says what proved so attractive was that terrorism had become a kind of philosophy through which to express frustration resentment and blind hatred a kind of political expressionism which used bombs to express oneself which watched delightedly the publicity giving to the resounding deeds and was absolutely willing to pay the price of life for having succeeded in forcing the recognition of one's existence on the normal strata of society right in other words right the, these it's 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 a new philosophy it's a new art form right death torture blood destruction right um, terror is the new form of expression we see it in you know serial killers and spree shooters and terrorist cells and state governments right they they make their voice heard through mass violence and and what is how is this connected well it's connected to everything she's been talking about so far right um, the you know the belief that nothing is true therefore everything is permitted allows certain people in power to create propaganda machines that then create a mindset in the mass population wherein terror and violence are seen as normal ways of behaving normal ways of getting your point across and then it spreads from them the true goal of totalitarian totalitarian propaganda is not persuasion right but organization of the polity right in other words the the political masses right your citizens like the german population the american population the russian population right that's the whole point of the totalitarian propaganda like direct their mindset to get them to behave the way you want them to behave did it ever occur to you that 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 the people above want you fighting and hating each other in america right if you're busy fighting republicans and democrats then you won't be fighting the real enemy right the real people pulling your strings so this is kind of what she's getting at she says the banality of evil right uh, evil is banal banal means like super basic um, ordinary every day the guy that's in the next cubicle to you in the office right the banality of evil lies in the bureaucracy right uh, mobilization of entire national populations wherein no single person is responsible for the atrocities committed by the state all right think about that who do you execute when you beat the nazis all of them suddenly you become guilty of genocide too right um, you if you, you and you go after the leaders how many of the leaders ever fired a gun eichmann was responsible for stamping files and paperwork never fired a gun and yet that stamp responsible for millions of deaths right uh, Hitler never fired a gun to kill a single person during the Holocaust and yet his speeches just talking killed millions right in a bureaucracy right like with all these offices and individuals working for the same goal who do you blame who should you execute who should you arrest 
for the murder of millions, right? And that's that's the terrible part of it, right? That's the terror here. Um, the last century has produced an abundance of ideologies that pretend to be keys to history, but are actually nothing but desperate efforts to escape responsibility. Um, everyone wants to blame, you know, Trump or Republicans or Biden or Democrats, um, you know, or women or gays or Christians or blacks or cops or, you know, er and 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 you, we create this kind of like group that you know immigrants or whatever uh, Muslims you know Jews we, we create these groups to hate um, and and the people who are kind of getting you to hate them are the ones that come in with the promising the keys to history if you follow me I'm gonna solve all our problems we're gonna finally reach that utopia we've been working towards we're finally gonna end history with no more need for progress or conflict or war because we're going to wipe them all out and then it's just us, right? Um, and so notice Arendt is kind of pointing out that this is what's seductive, right? These people promise you solutions. First, they, by convincing you that they already know what the problem is, them, whoever they are, right? Because it's easier to believe that than accept this, right? That it's all of us. We're burning the earth. We're keeping poor people poor. We're misusing our financial and environmental resources, right? So, notice, we try to escape responsibility by looking for someone to hate. She says in the next quote, evil comes from a failure to think. It defies thought, for as soon as thought tries to engage itself with evil, examine the premises and principles from which it originates, it is frustrated because it finds nothing there. That is the banality of evil, right? It, it, it is Evil is so basic, there's nothing there, right? We're fascinated by it because we don't understand it. We want to learn, we don't want to learn about the victims of an esprit shooting. We want to know about the person who went to get the gun and came in and do these things, right? We're, we're, we're interested by it, but what Arendt points out is if we really dig in deep on, on these perpetrators of violence we don't find anything there at all much less anything interesting right there's nothing there there's there's no like seed of evil there right we don't see the devil possessing them um, they're just ordinary people like the rest of us and the switch gets flipped right and that switch can be people's websites right think of Rwanda Rwanda genocide was a repetition it came after like you know days and weeks of months of radio uh, kind of blasting these words into their ears and into their brains about certain neighbors being cockroaches that needed to be stamped out right um, next quote here's where we get into Eichmann specifically Except for an extraordinary diligence in looking out for his personal advancement, Eichmann had no motives at all. Like he didn't really hate the Jewish people. He just wanted to be promoted and rise up in the German ranks. He merely, to put the matter colloquially, never realized what he was doing. It was sheer thoughtlessness, something by no means identical with stupidity. Notice he's not dumb, he just doesn't think. Or at least he doesn't think about the real consequences of him stamping those forms, right? It was sheer thoughtlessness that predisposed him to become one of the greatest criminals of that historical period. And if this is banal and even funny, if with the best will in the world one cannot extract any diabolical or demonic profundity from Eichmann, this is still far from calling it commonplace. Such remoteness from reality, such thoughtlessness can wreak more havoc than all the evil instincts taken together, which perhaps are inherent in man. That was, in fact, the lesson one could learn in Jerusalem. By her watching this guy, like she heard him talk. She heard him explain himself. She heard him testify, trying to save his own life. 
and the only thing she could figure out is that this guy was like he had turned off that part of his brain that makes him question his own actions and decisions to such an extent that he was removed from reality what we call displacement at this point right and the crazy part is displacement is so common nowadays today that it's i mean it's you don't just see it in eichmann and hitler and stalin anymore right it we we all displace from mo certain moments in our lives we disconnect because we just don't want to deal with it anymore right and what she's pointing out is there's a danger in that disconnection because that's what allows us to become thoughtless and to do stupid things we normally wouldn't do that end up wreaking havoc on human lives the trouble with Eichmann she concludes was precisely that so many were like him he ends up being he's not a devil he's just like everybody else if you saw pictures of him online you would see he looks like an accountant right the many right the many were never neither perverted nor sadistic they were and still are terribly and terrifyingly normal right Eichmann is normal a lot of the Nazis that were responsible for literally blowing people's brains out and asking the grandparents to throw their grandchildren's bodies into ovens to get rid of the evidence by burning them to ash these were totally normal people before they did this they were bakers they were soldiers they were accountants they were bankers um, they, they were carpenters they were engineers like these were totally normal Germans before all this from the viewpoint of our legal institutions and our moral standards of judgment this normal was much more terrifying than the atrocities put together the fact that these would be people you normally have coffee with should scare us right? um, Hannah Arendt doesn't have answers for us she's just kind of pointing out what's wrong that she leaves up to us I hope you enjoyed the lecture uh, we got one lecture left for this semester and that's Michel Foucault who brings us into the most into the postmodern 